Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the call this morning. A reasonably short call, but we thought it was an opportunity to uh, reach out to our shareholders and have a chat about the work programme that we completed last year and also talk about our plans for our next year's work programme. Just to introduce you to my team, Frank, who hasn't met them, on my right-hand side is our Chief Operating Officer, John Leather. On my left-hand side is our Chief Financial Officer, David Quirk. 2021 was a really good year for the company. We had 100% success rate with development drilling and exploration drilling. We five and five wells drilled and successfully drilled with average production just over 2,300 barrels of oil equivalent uh, for the average for the full year. It was a good year in terms of our production, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. We did have a challenge with our ash well in terms of a water cut. John will talk about that shortly which resulted in us reducing our full year guidance last September. In saying that, being positive, we now understand the subsurface of ash a lot better and it still is a prolific reservoir for the company. We started last year with the intention of drilling four wells and we ended up adding a fifth well to the drilling programme, which is a demonstration of our flexibility around our CapEx commitments and our CapEx programme as the oil price strengthened. Whilst we had very successful drilling and the wells we drilled were brought into production quickly and an extremely quick payback, we don't take that success for granted. Our long-term strategy for the Abbasenna concession will be to try and maximise as much value from that as we possibly can. And we'll do that with our four well drilling programme this year, our indicative four wells the following year and four more wells the year after that. We also announced this morning our production guidance for half one next year. We are doing four wells next year, and two of which will be reasonably large exploration wells. And because of the potential scale of those wells, we've deemed it more appropriate to guide for only the first six months of uh, 2022. Two wells that exploration wells that we will be drilling contain between them over 10 million barrels of potential main resources. So they are significant in size, and given the potential size, it feels more appropriate to only guide for the first six months of the year and to review that guidance as we drill and execute our work programmes in the first quarter and second quarter of the year. Whilst production is, the production guidance for the first half may be a little bit lower than expected, I would draw your attention back to the performance of the asset since we completed the acquisition. When we completed the deal or we announced the deal, the asset was performing or producing 800 barrels of oil equivalent. And since then, we've increased production substantially. Um, as most of you will know, nothing ever moves in a straight line, but we certainly are confident with the work program that we have proposed for this year and for the years beyond that, that we can absolutely trap the longer term value contained within the concession. We're also pleased to announce a two-year license extension in Jamaica, which gives us security over title for the license for the longer term, and it means that we can continue our farmland efforts on that part of the portfolio. On the right-hand side of this slide, we also announced our numbers this morning, generating $19 million of revenue. Our cash collections in Egypt were strong, were over $17 million collected, and we also invested $5.5 million back into the portfolio leaving us with cash on hand at the end of the year, $1.2 million. We also realised a strong oil price for the period of $68 a barrel, almost $69 a barrel. I'll pass it over to John, our Chief Operating Officer, to have a run through the assets. Thanks, Brian, and um, hello, everybody. Um, and so, you clearly going to have a, a number of different assets which were provided an update on the trading statement um, this morning, including the update on the progress that may be made with signing the Jamaican licence that Brian alluded to. But the focus of this short slide deck is really on the Amazon assets um, onshore Egypt, and particularly looking at what's going to happen in the work programme for 2022. However, before we uh, get on to this year's programme and what's going to happen in that, I think it's worth having a brief review of the activity that occurred on the ass assets and the license during 2021. First thing to say, it was a very successful year um, last year in terms of success with drill bid. We drilled five wells and um, have five successes, 100% success record, uh, that span both exploration and development drilling. And with 
typical paybacks, typically three to 12 months in those wells, they clearly are drilling out a lot of value to the license. And you can see the impact it even had on, on full year production in 2021 on the bar chart there of the green section shows the contribution that the, the wells were actually drilled last year and made to production um, last year. Now those wells clearly added value in terms of production and revenue, but it also every well we drill contributes to the knowledge that we have on the asset. And having drilled five wells last year, you know, that's added not just to our understanding of the producing fields, but also to the, uh, the exploration area, and helping to really de-risk uh, the, the exploration targets that we will be targeting this year and beyond. There were two exploration wells drilled last year, and um, both of them made commercial discoveries. Between them, um, we estimate they added around 2 million barrels um, of gross reserves, and we had 20-year 20 20-year long concession grant over both of those commercial discoveries, which you can see highlighted on the map here, at ASX and ASD. And with production from those fields uh, coming online last year, we now have eight producing fields in the Arizona license. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, that given that two of those three successful development wells that happened last year were into the Al Jarrah field, um, of those eight producing fields, Al Jarrah is now the largest contributor to production from Avicenna, contributing to a little over a third of the total production. I think when, when reviewing 2021, we also need to mention um, the ash field. Um, and during the summer of last year, we saw a faster anticipated increase in the water cut and decrease in, in the production uh, from the wells on that field. We provided a report on that in early September, but I'm pleased to be able to report data since that time, beginning of September, with wells flowing on a more constrained choke. We have seen a stabilization in both the decline in production and the increase in water cut. And we now have time to really monitor the field, um, observe the behavior of the wells, and complete more detailed technical work, including reservoir modeling and incorporating results of the ASH 3 well that was drilled last year. We're now at a stage where we, we have a very good understanding of the field. And the first thing that that has led to is that you know, we will be in the 2022 work program installing um, ESPs, or electrical submersible pumps, into each of the ash wells, looking to, to maintain the flow rates from those wells, um, optimize uh, production, and maximize the ultimate recovery from the field. The other thing that's become clear from the technical work that we've done on ash over the last number of months is that there's a very large um, stub at the field. So that's the, the oil that's actually in place there. We estimate that's around 15 million barrels. Given the rates that we know these wells can fly, thousands of barrels for today, we know there's a lot of oil left in the ground. We want to get as much of that out as possible, both through the existing wells with the ESP installation, but also through future drilling and uh, looking to, to map and looking to target that large volume that we know is there. Indeed, we now have a, a firm ash well, a firm development well, into the ash field on the 2022 program, which I'll come back to in the coming slides. Which leads us on then into the, uh, the drilling program for, or the uh, operating program for uh, the coming year. Um, to go through it, you see there's a lot of activity planned for 2022. And the first thing to say is all of that work program is fully funded. With four firm wells planned, two of these are development wells. Um, the ASD2 well, which pleased to say we announced alongside the trade state this morning, has now commenced drilling, so that's currently in the way. And also the uh, ASH5 well, which is what I was talking about on the previous slide, which will be drilled into the ASH field. In addition to those wells, we have two firm exploration wells, ASF1X and ASB1X. Slightly confusingly, ASV1X on some previous on previous slide it was named as ASD1X. It is the same structure, it's just had it been renamed. And between them, those two wells are targeting combined mean recoverable resource estimated at around 10 million barrels. Now to put that into context, um, that, that figure is five times um, the volume that was targeted with two exploration wells last year. So these really are material exploration wells that are chasing and potentially high impact volumes. Now the chart down at the bottom of the slide shows the, the drilling schedule and the current plan for the year. Um, but it is important to note that this is um, you know, a flexible program um, and it could be, could be subject to change in terms of the order of some of the wells. Indeed, there is a, a potential additional fifth well 
should be a water injector into the Al Jarrah Southeast field, which is contingent on the results of ongoing technical studies, really looking to quantify the value that a, a well there could add and decisions expect on that well um, during the first quarter of this year. We also have ongoing technical work program. Um, we're currently in the process of reprocessing uh, an area of 450 square kilometers of 3D seismic data. It's highlighted on the map there in orange. So you can see that this area covers both the Ashfield and the ASF exploration target. And really what that work is looking to do is make sure we've got the best possible, the most accurate possible picture of the subsurface in that area. And clearly, with those wells planned on the schedule this year, we want to make sure that any fine-tuning of the locations takes into account and uses that data. And the reason I'm kind of coming to that in a bit of detail is, is to say that you know if we do want to bring a well forward in the drilling program to potentially come in after the ASV2 well, um, it's most likely to be the ASV1S exploration once we do want to complete our site reprocessing before going on to Hatch 5 or ASF. In parallel with the, the drilling program that we have lined up, there are eight workovers planned for this year, um, which again you can see on the chart outlined there, and that will include um, these ESPs that we're looking to install on the three ash wells. As I said before, we're aiming to maintain um, the flow rates from the wells and really uh, maximise the recovery from the field. In terms of what we expect, or what that drilling program, or that activity program is likely to deliver, um, starting off with the, the H1 production guidance, um, I think, you know, as Brian's already alluded to, we've, we've, the guidance provided between 1,500 to 1,650 BOEs per day. Um, that is for the first half only, with at least four wells planned this year, including two exploration wells. I believe this is a sensible approach to assess the initial results of that drilling program before providing uh, full year guidance. It's also worth noting that the first half of production that's given only includes production from the existing wells, plus a partial contribution from the ASD2 well. And that well is, is currently drilling, but we're not expecting it to come on stream and start uh, contributing to production until the second quarter of this year. So that means we're not going to see the full half of production from it. But the impact that the drilling program is going to have, you know, when we look at the chart um, above with the, the production shine, uh, production from the field since its onset in 2012, we're projecting it into the future. I think as we move through this year and into 2023, you can really see the potential of the drilling campaign and the potential out, particularly from the exploration wells um, that we are drilling this year. I'll come on to those on the next slide, but it is important to also stress that the planned development wells, which are low cost, Low risk wells are also expected to add significant value um, to the asset. And some of the details on those wells are provided uh, on the map here on the right hand side of the slide. So the ASD2 well, um, you can see its location there. Uh, say it's, it's currently underway, it is drilling at the moment. It's a follow up to successful ASD exploration well, we made the commercial discovery last year. So, a number of aims, including looking to prove up the gross upside volumes of five and a half million bottles of in-place uh, volumes that are estimated to be held in the Arrowrush Sea Reservoir. Um, it'll also be looking to production from the field and will also be targeting a secondary objective in slightly deeper Arrowrush E Reservoirs. Second firm uh, development well is the, the Ash 5 well. Uh, the primary target of that well is the Arm El Gue or AEB Reservoirs, um, which has produced over three and a half million barrels from the field to date and individual wells to be produced at over you know, in the thousands of barrels of oil per day. As I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, the, the latest thing the work we've been doing indicates that there's clearly a large in-place oil volume at this field in the region of 15 million barrels gross. So there's you know, a large price to get over here, to, to get after here, um, well has potential to deliver a very high flow rates. So clearly it's, it's you know, a high impact uh, Potential development well, um, one that we are very much looking forward to drill once we have the planning and processing to ensure that well is optimally located in the field. So we've got exciting development drilling coming up. That's really the focus of the first half of the year. And then start looking there, moving on to the exploration wells that will come into the second half that really have that potential to provide a step change in terms of production coming uh, from the license. 
So this slide's then you know, at those exploration targets, um, two exploration wells over this year, they are high impact wells, they are targeting large exploration volumes. The guess makes be around 10 million barrels um, gross. So before is five times um, the volumes that were targeted with the exploration drilling of last year. Although they are large targets, it's important to emphasize as well that they're also um, you know, comparatively low risk. This is a prolific basin. It's a well understood basin. Historically, we've seen very high exploration rates, getting up to close to 80%. And with the continuing work we're doing and the continuing incorporation of all drilling results that we've had over the last two years, and doing all the technical work we can, uh, including scientific processing, doing everything we can to ensure um, that you know, what we are targeting are uh, not just the largest ones, but also you know, you know, de risking them as far as we possibly can. The bubble plot on this slide, um, this is based on United's um, internal estimates of uh, volume along the horizontal axis and chance of success along the vertical axis. And it shows clearly where the two wells we're targeting this year sit in the larger portfolio of exploration targets that sit in the Addison license. And one thing that stands out very clearly on this um, plot is the vast majority of the targets identified, not just the two that have been drilled this year, sit well to the right of the blue line on the chart here. And that blue line represents the minimum commercial field size. And I think it's really a testament to you know, the low operating uh, cost environment we have here, the low drilling cost environment, that so many of the targets here are clearly um, you know, commercial, should we have success at them. The other thing I think stands out very clearly on this is ASF on X. It's clearly the largest um, target um, that we have currently on the license, um, over 8 million barrels of potential within it. Um, it's targeting the prolific AB reservoir. We've had success with the ash, so not just large volume, but also um, in the wells there, these would be potentially capable of flying at rates of thousands of barrels for today. So, on its own, um, yeah, very exciting well. Um, it's one that you know, United have had high rated for a while, and we're very pleased to be uh, drilling this year out on the firm drilling schedule. It's also, its value is not just in the fact that what it will deliver itself, but should we have success there, there are a number of other targets in that southern area of the Abraxan uh, license that would be deemed risk by success here. So it also could lead to follow-on uh, further exploration drilling. And then we move on to the ASB 1X well, uh, slightly small, but it is the, the largest undrilled Abraxan sea structure um, in the in the area center license. And those reservoirs, the same reservoirs have been so successfully developed and produced from at the Al Jarrah field. Um, and similarly to the ASF, um, well, it is, if we have success there in its eastern portion of the license, it does potentially de risk a number of other structures in that area. So to finish up, hopefully giving you, giving you a, a flavor of you know, all the, the, the activity, the amount of activity that we have planned for the coming year. It is an exciting program. There's, there's lots going on, lots of opportunities to move the license forward um, through increasing production, adding reserves, and also unlocking the exploration potential. I think it's a program we're very much looking forward um, to delivering, we're very much looking forward to seeing the results. And I'm looking forward to engaging again with, with you once we have the progress to report on this. With that, I will um, pass back to Brian. Thanks, thanks, John. We've covered quite a lot in a short period of time, but I hope it's given you a flavour of the potential still to come next year from particularly the exploration wells that we drill have mean could have potentially meaningful impact on our production guidance. And to reiterate, we deem it more appropriate to uh, only forecast for the first six months of the year whilst we await the initial uh, drill results. I think at this stage, we're, we're happy to run through some questions which have been submitted. Sharon. Thank you. Please be mindful that um, our financial results will be audited in April, so we may be limited in what we can say uh, at this stage. First question, uh, David, please can you confirm that all scheduled loan repayments to BP have been made in the second half of 21 and confirm the balance outstanding on the 31st of December 2021? Yeah, I can certainly confirm that we're up to date on, on all our obligations, both operational and financial, at the year end. And um, so we're fully up to date, obviously, with BP. And um, we have about four and a half million dollars of uh, balance outstanding at the end of the year. And you've seen in the trading update this morning that we're looking at 
quite in, in advanced discussions with Dan, with BP to extend the tenor of that facility to create just additional flexibility to, um, you know, to execute and maybe increase the uh, program across uh, the assets in 2022. Thank you. Uh, one more question for you, David. Are cash collections from EGPC up to date as of the 31st of December 2021, i.e. only the contracted two months of invoicing are in debtors? Yeah, I think you've seen the trading statement this morning that we've had cash collections across the year in excess of $17 million. So we see no issues collecting from EGPC, as we've mentioned on a number of calls before. And yes, we're in the range of that uh, two months uh, invoices are standing at the year end from EGPC. Thank you. John, um, in the 2021 capital budget, a number of well workovers were budgeted, but only the results of one ash sorry, of only one, ASH1, was RNS. Were the remainder undertaken last year in the plan for 2022 or later? Um, yeah, a number of workers were conducted last year. So yes, they were, uh, most of those would have been completed last year. Um, but it is just uh, something we do report on the drilling results, but we tend not to uh, report on individual worker results. Thank you. Next question. Um, in your presentations, you've shown effective government take at 57% at $63 Brent. What is the effective government take at $89 Brent? Does the effective United take include OPEX? Yeah, in that, in that, uh, for that question, I just refer you back to our interim results presentation where we gave an illustrative example of how the, the uh, fiscal uh, framework works under the PSC. And just in, in short response to the question, there's no difference in the government take. It doesn't vary with oil price. So it's consistent across the oil price. And uh, there's a good detailed example in our interim results presentation, which will take you through an illustrative calculation. Thank you. John, um, are you able to disclose which company is reprocessing the seismic? Um, not, not at this stage, no. <laughs> like, uh, we, that, it's being handled by, by, by the operator. We are opening into it, but I think we leave it to, to the operator to disclose that information. Thank you. Are you able to provide more information on the type of seismic and processing that is being conducted? Is the product going to be pre stack time or pre stack depth? Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question, one that I could probably talk about for a while. I think um, what, what we've seen in, in part of the reason we're doing this is. And you look at the previous processing that's being done on it, you know, when you move from pre-site time to pre-site depth, um, that's when you can actually change the shape of it. And we've got some differences between us. What we're looking to do is make sure that we are um, really taking into account all of the data that's there, being as careful and reprocessing it in, in the most effective way. Um, as I said, I could talk on time, but the simple answer is yes, we would take pre -site depth. Thank you, John. Trying to understand how 19 million revenue and only a cash balance year end in a 70 plus oil environment with only 1.2 million. Is there a big receivables overhang built up at the year end? No, I think we've addressed the receivables question earlier on. There isn't. I think the 70 plus oil environment is uh, is probably accurate for the you know not but not um, you know. Not not across the, the entire year. Um, so there are some of the receivables at the higher oil price will be made in the in the start of this year. But more importantly, I think it's the fact that you know we've drilled five wells last year. We've had you know 12 months of debt repayments to BP. So there are, you know, the all will kind of be shown in our in our cash flow when we present the, the full year results. But indicatively we've got debt repayments, we've got our CapEx, OPEX, and the GE. Thank you, David. John, maybe this one's for you. Um, the RNS says stabilisation of the decline in production. It also says that production at the start of September was 1,817 BOEPD, while the average was 1,838 BOPD, implying an increase over the quarter. Why then is guidance for H1 2022 1,500 to 1,650? Sure, yeah. I think, first of all, the, the stabilisation of time production relates to the ash field, which is one of eight fields on the OSF license. We did see um, you know, remarkably stable production over overall fields from the, from the asset um, during quarter four, which is where the 1838 uh, period of the day number comes 
from that included um, additions that were made from as well as that were came on stream during that time. Now, as I went through the presentation, the H1 uh, production numbers really isn't taking into account any of the new drilling other than a partial contribution from the ASD2 well. So we would expect, as in any oil field, that you would expect to see a natural decline in fields, and that, that's what we're expecting to see in H1 and 2022. And then as we move further on in later year into 2023, we see the impact or potential impact of the drilling program that we have set for this year. And that's when you know, we think there could be chances to actually start moving that number positively. Thank you, John. Does the heavy rig workover schedule in H1 affect guidance? And on that front, again, much as we want to see the results of the drilling programme, we'd also like to see you know, all, all the technical work that's going on during the uh, first half of the year um, will obviously be incorporated uh, when we are in a position to, to issue the full year guidance. What is the average API values of the oil in the Abu Said and licence, please? Um, it's it's typically light oil comes from license, um, you know, it's high quality uh, light crude. Um, there'll be a range of different APIs, but, but typically in that range. Thank you. Um, why are the current wells production declining at a steep rate? Are they declining at a steep rate? Going forward, can we expect the same rate of decline, or has there been unexpected problems in those wells? No, I. I I think, you know, when we look at the, the decline rates in the field as a whole, we're not seeing, um, I don't know quite where the steep rate has come from. You know, we had the uh, steep declines I explained last summer at the ash field, now seeing stabilisation of that decline. Um, you know, we're not, we don't um, put out there our individual estimates on individual fields or the decline yet. But if you do look at the year end 2020 reserve report that is on our website, that includes. Um, you know, an independently audited um, decline rates of the field over the next five, five to ten years, which is typically an asset wide basis from about 15% in the 2P case. Thanks, John. What's happening with divestment cash? And the divestment cash, uh, you know, once those proceeds are received, they'll be used to reinvest in the business to uh, fund growth, both organic and inorganic growth. I think you'll have seen in the trading the state, statement this morning on the three transactions we've uh, updated um, where we're at on, on the three of those, and we look forward to updating the market as we um, satisfy the conditions to completion. And on the crown transaction, um, we expect to be making an announcement during February on that transaction. Thank you. Next question. What is the net increase in 2P reserves? Um, well, we've got, we have our own estimates of the um, increase that's been provided from the two exploration wells um, that were drilled last year, um, just over 2 million barrels of oil um, from those added in. In terms of the reserves as a whole, um, you know, we, we are awaiting an updated um, reserves report um, that we're typically released at the same time as our financial states and the annual report uh, does come out. And at that point, we would get an idea of what we're expecting on, on that front. Thank you. Next question. At the current oil price of around $88, how much of that is net profit after taking into account all operator costs and payment to the Egyptian government? Um, you know, at this stage, we're not in a position to comment on, on profit. We just put some headline numbers out for last year, and um, you know, you will see a full update on the uh, income statement in the annual results in, uh, in April. Thank you, David. Is the gas produced still hedged? Can UOG avail of recent upside in price? It's it's not hedged the gas price in Egypt. It's a fixed price gas contract with with UGC. So whilst that is um, a steady income stream, um, it, it is, there isn't um, access to the upside in current gas prices as we do on fixed price gas contract. Thank you. Next <coughs> question. Have you made any progress in your search for m and targets? Are these pending on additional cash generation <coughs> and the receipt of disposable proceeds? Well, I'll take that one, Sharon. We we're continuously looking for opportunities to scale up the company that will create value for our shareholders. We did look at a number of opportunities throughout last year. And in fact, we brought a small number 
further in a process but decided ultimately that they weren't a fit for us. Part of the challenge we've set ourselves is that we've got high investment hurdles and we are, that means that we have to remain particularly patient when we're looking for the right opportunities. And that approach previously has been vindicated with the success that we've achieved in Egypt. In terms of cash generation uh, or disposal proceeds to fund any acquisition, in an ideal scenario we'd like to be using as much of our own balance sheet coupled with debt as possible to acquire assets. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're necessarily relying on, on, on doing that. If an opportunity comes along that we feel will be value agreed, but does require an equity component or an equity raise, well, we'll obviously consider that. Thank you, Brian. Can uh, the company comment on the share price and why it's falling shareholder value and erosion of the share price? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, the share price performance has been extremely disappointing for everybody, uh, including us and including my wider team, who worked extremely hard on managing the assets of the business. So it has been frustrating we don't necessarily see the immediate reward in the share price. There's a number of factors that drive share price, some of which are within our control and some are not in our control, such as macroeconomic sentiment towards the sector. There's not much we can do about that. But what we can do is continue to manage the business the best way that we can by executing our work program successfully, by ensuring that we're threatening our balance sheet, by ensuring that we're creating and extracting as much value as we can from our portfolio. I can only point back to our track record over the last year and how we've managed the business between the successful wells that we've drilled, the increase in production since we acquired the assets, and also the investments that we've, that we've announced. We've also got a really strong work program committed to for next year, which will include two development wells, which we've touched upon, but also two really exciting exploration opportunities, one of which is actually the largest in our exploration pipeline for Aquasenin. So there's so much value still to come from the existing asset base, and I'm really confident that we'll eventually, if not sooner, see that value reflected in the share price. Thank you, Brian. Next question. Would the company <coughs> look at starting a dividend or any buyback programs? I'll take that one, Sharon. We've always been pretty clear on this um, from the existing asset base and the existing portfolio. We, we don't intend to provide for a dividend um, or a share buyback. But we're not going to rule that out as the company grows and scales up. And We've touched upon in the past about how much organic growth there is still to come within the portfolio. We've seen that from the slide that we presented today. The potential is there within the asset base. And maybe as this existing asset base, if it was to stand as it is over the next number of years, we may be in a position to provide a dividend. But certainly any acquisition that we look towards as we look to scale up and grow the company, that is starting to become part of our consideration. But to answer your question, Honestly, and, and unfortunately, in the short term, there's no immediate term uh, plans to pay dividend from the existing asset base. Thank you, Brian. Next question. Uh, David, what is the balance on the BP debt? Yeah, I think that's a question we might have had earlier, Sean, but at the year end, it was four and a half million dollars. And as we previously mentioned, uh, we're um, extending the tenor of that so we create uh, flexibility uh, for the company. Thank you. You said that some of the Drilling, that you're drilling some of your largest targets on the license this year. Why have these not been drilled already? And how do these compare in size to some of the targets already drilled? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. I think um, when you're looking at exploration drilling, you know, you want to make sure that all the other pieces of work you can possibly do to de-risk those targets prior to actually drilling them has been completed. I think particularly when you look at ASF, which is potentially five times size of some of the, the previous targets that we have uh, drilled over the course of last year. And that in itself has benefited from our increasing our understanding of the ash field and the AEB reservoirs that have you know, we've had success with there. So really, uh, another nearby drilling as well. So when you take a while to do it, it's, it's a question of getting it at the right time when you've had a chance to actually do as much as you can to de-risk the target prior to drilling it. And I think it is fair to say that you know the ASF structure Given their size, it's not surprising it has been, you know, on United's uh, radar for a while, and that we have been keen to drill for a while, and one that we are very excited to be at the end of this year. Thank you, John. 
Um, are you optimistic regarding the Jamaica Farm Act? Has there been any interest from relevant parties? Uh, yes, I think we are optimistic. There have been, you know, we, we, we've been very pleased with engagement we've had a number of different uh, companies at the moment. I think the, the announcement that was included in the training statement today that we now have signed um, the extension for two years on Jamaican license has also been, been positively received. Thank you. Do you feel that Jamaica is priced into the share price right now? I would take that on. Um, the answer is no, and to be perfectly frank, I don't think a quarter of our portfolio is, is factored into our share price right now. But absolutely, Jamaica is, there's no value for Jamaica in our share price at the minute. But in saying that, should we farm on the asset, should we have some further developments in that, I'd see a considerable re-rate of the share price on the back of that for Jamaica. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, has there been any discussion amongst the adversarial partners to renegotiate the terms of the PSC with EGPC to increase the cost oil percentage? I know there hasn't been any discussions with EGPC on that. I can't really comment for Ferros or Translover, some of the peer companies in Egypt, but they've uh, renegotiated uh, uh, their terms to launch sort of significant uh, investment programs that probably needed those deals to be done to uh, to make the investments uh, economically worthwhile. So on our license, there are currently no discussions to uh, amend the fiscal terms. Thank you. If there's no further questions. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining the call this morning. Thank you for your support. And uh, I'd just like to thank my own team. A lot of work and effort went in to produce the training update this morning. And not just the document that was produced this morning, but everything that went into it is over a year's worth of work. So I just want to thank my, my team here with you today, my extended team for the hard work throughout 2021. And uh, to remind everybody as well within my team that we need to continue that hard work into 2022. Thank you.